welcome to my studio. Hi friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Fiona and I'm a full-time artist. And on this channel, I like to take you with me in my artistic journey, whether that means working on projects here in my studio, going out to see art exhibits, buying art supplies and sharing my haul with you, basically any art related content. So if that sounds like something you're into, please like and subscribe. It's one free click for you, but it makes a big, big difference for my channel and I would really, really appreciate it. So we are back today with our final studio tour of the series. In case you've missed it, these last few weeks I've been posting studio tours from my artist friends that very generously have invited us into their spaces to see how they organize things, their thoughts on their art practice, and just their life in general as artists. So thank you so, so much to them for being so generous and sharing their spaces and time with us. And thank you to all of you that have been watching it. So if you've missed it, I have a playlist below. You can check out all of them there. So the reason I did all these studio tours is I have been hard at work on a holiday shop launch. So we'll be having ceramic vases, earrings, spoon rests, brush rests, a whole host of things, as well as postcards, paintings, drawings, lots and lots of giftable items for you. It will be launching on Friday, November 29th, which is Black Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So Stay tuned here, or you can join my newsletter to get a direct link when the site launches, or follow on Instagram where I've been giving updates over there. But we are very soon going to be jumping into all the holiday prep videos, and I'm extremely excited to share that with you. So, yep, that's what will be coming up next here. But for today's video, we have my friend Donna Payton. She is an amazing, amazing painter and sculptor who works from both known shapes as well as improvised shapes in her work and she has a way of bringing order to disorder in what she does and the colors are vibrant the compositions are gorgeous and i adore her work her work is what i will want in my home one day when i can get one of her gigantic paintings with one of the sculptures hanging off of it i want that i need that um you will see though she has a stunning studio space. Like her space is absolute studio goals, but she has had a very, very long career as an artist and she is amazing. She teaches as well. She has so much wisdom to share. And I was just so thrilled that she was open to letting me film her in her space and sharing her with you. But she does have a solo show coming up if you do want to see it for yourself in person, which I highly recommend. It's called Vibrant Matter, and it will be opening at Mammoth Museum in Lincroft, New Jersey on January 12th. The opening is from, let me check here, four to six. And the show will be up until February 22nd. So you have time to see that. That's next year, 2025. Mark your calendars please go check it out. Her work is great and it deserves to be seen in person as well. So with all that said, we are going to jump into Donna's studio tour. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed editing it. Let's do it. Well, thank you so very much for having us in your beautiful studio. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your art practice? Well, my name is Donna Payton and I have been making art since I was six months old and never wanted to do anything else or be anything else but an artist. And I have been an art teacher too, to supplement my income. Uh, and I work currently now at the Arts Council in Princeton teaching a mixed media course. And um, I'm off for the summer, but uh, in my studio, since I'm a mixed media artist, I make all kinds of things. I'll work in clay. And this is a piece that will go into a base for a piece of sculpture that'll be in a show at Mammoth Museum. I'm having a solo show there in January of 2025. Great, we're gonna put a link to that below for you guys to check out. When I work, I never work on just one thing. I generally work on about seven things at one time. So right here, 
I will work on drawings or collages. And I always have a lineup. I have them like piled up so that when I finish one or, or when I get to a resting point or a thinking place, I can go to another one. And also I tell my students, work on more than one thing so that the pieces don't get overcrowded with all of your ideas and materials and media. That's um, such a good point. Yes, it, it really is important. So um, this is a collage mixed media piece that I'm working on. And then I love working on photographs that I've taken. So this, this is a paint skin. I love making paint skins with gel medium and gloss medium. And then I embed it with paint or glitter and I attach them to photographs. I've been very interested in the triangles that you find in nature and this whole idea of connectivity and um, geometrics that are in uh, nature and that we see and I'm trying to bring that out. This was painted on here. It's not finished, this has just started. And then th these are pieces of uh, canvas that are painted that I'm gonna move around to find the triangular uh, areas that I'm gonna work in. So then this piece is another one that you have those triangles as well that you're currently working on. Right, because I see, I've been seeing it more often in trees because of my view all, mm. all the time. I'm, I'm watching nature change. I'm watching the, now it's full and fluffy green and slowly it'll, the leaves will turn, which offers another palette for me to respond to. And then also I'll see the structure of the trees once the leaves have fallen. And so it's become I don't know, very important for me to use uh, trees in my, my drawings and in my photographs and, and in some of my paintings, not the ones that are currently in the studio now. I do like things in nature and I was attracted, oh, maybe, maybe 30 years ago to gourds. Mm. And I started using gourds in my small assemblages and that became like an alter ego or, or a character, that shape, would just to, to whip out this, this shape of this, you know, the, the gourd, you know, um, head, you know, as I see it, uh, popping out and being a, a structure that I could repeat so, uh, so easily and so nicely in my, my drawings and in my sketches. So I started using that form, you saw the clay piece earlier, and I started using that form more and more in, in my paintings. And in a, a museum in, I think, Austria, I saw an artist who used black and white stripes. And then I saw Charlene Van Heil using it when she had her, uh, at the Hirschhorn Museum, when she had her solo show, she was using all these black and white stripes and I couldn't get them out of my, I just couldn't stop thinking. And so about black and white stripes. So I started putting them on these shapes that I was drawing and it, and it had to be straight edge. And then doing the other uh, paintings around it. This is mixed media, this is tool. These are tool circles that are at, on top of this, my, <laughs> My sort of like nod to Gerhard Richter here. Yes, right. <laughs> How it's like dragged across. Do you use just a brush for that on uh, top of it? I did not. I used a putty knife, uh -huh. um, a, a wide one that they actually, I think what they use for drywall. Oh, okay. You know, when they put the strip on. Right, they, yep. They go, exactly, yep. So I use that to, uh, but I have done other drag paintings where I use actual windows. Uh, squeegees. 
Yeah. And I put it down on the floor and it's on a long handle. Yeah. And I'll just drag it. I don't have any of those pieces out here now. But Yeah. Well, I was just thinking the Gerard Richer reference because I think about him just dragging those large. Yeah. I love watching <laughs> his machine that he had yeah. you know, working. So so that so that's about this piece. And then after lately I have like in the last I say five years. I, I see I love making mixed media assemblages and I love using recycled objects and I would have them be the separate things that I'm working on and maybe I would paint them and put them in the painting maybe I wouldn't but I decided that I wanted to meld them I wanted to have them be a part of the campus by hanging them in front of the canvas like I've done right here. And I've done, I don't know, maybe like 10 or 15 like that. So I make the things be not to be purposefully put in a, a certain thing. I, I make them first. Like this one, this one doesn't have, this one doesn't have a painting yet. Oh, uh, okay. And then like this is, this is, um, this was this was a little sleeve on here. Fabric is embedded in matte medium that I pour out on freezer paper. And then I tear it off of the freezer paper, really as it comes off. And then I am I started sewing with these seed beads and bugle beads in, in this. And then this gourd, I just actually I had laid this down in some paint. And when I picked it up, I saw that it had this like little bullseye effect. So then I just started pouring colors over it. And it'll end up in front of a painting at some point. I, so I keep it here to, to remember and think about it and not to force a painting. I don't make a painting for these things and I don't make these things for a painting. That's so interesting that that's a part of your process that they're made separately and then you just intuitively when you make two things completely separate and then you're like, you know what, these would go together. Is that how that is? Exactly. And wow. I'll, show, I'll show you more. So for example, I took a paper making course and this is screening that we dipped into paper. And I, I, I had, I had this for like, I don't know, six or seven years. A lot of times I have these things for a long time. At one point I painted it this gray color. This is actually house paint. Yep. And which I like using. And and then I had some leftover paint while I was working on painting, so I dripped it with this. And it didn't have this on here. So I this 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 painting is stretched with this sparkle material. Oh interesting. So, so that's the background. Yeah. That's underneath all of it. On top of um gator board. So then when I work I can get you know, I can get bullied with it, you know. Uh, I don't have to worry about the spring, you know, or, get, or catching the, the crossbars behind, which sure. happens. You know. And you have some natural texture that you get to build upon as well. Yeah, and I don't worry about if I put too much texture on, if that's going to cause things. it to sag or, you know, something. And this is a paint skin, which I cut out of a big sheet that I laid on freezer paper, and then I painted the stripes over it. But this was the multimedia colors that were on this. And then I glued it on, cut it to the shape I wanted, glued it on here, and then painted the rest of the canvas. In, again, I had, I had this mixture you see in the, in the painting over here. I still had it left and I just putty knifed it on and just smeared it out. When I went to Iceland, I saw all these basalt columns. Right. Could not stop thinking about them. I mean, I spent so much time sitting on a basalt column, looking at all the other basalt columns and photographing them. And I brought those photographs home and I, well, actually, even while I was there, I just kept on almost, it was, it was, it was like that uh, movie character in, um, where Dustin Hoffman keeps making the the mashed potato of the mound. Do you know? Oh that my movie? gosh! Yeah, I can't think of the name. I know the reference. And 
I was that way about these things. And I kept drawing them and reconfiguring them. And they're amazing. Once again, it's a geometric shape that you found in nature. So this is definitely a running theme in your work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when I was looking around the studio, and I have a, I'll show you my cache of ready-made assemblages to hang. I saw this and I go, oh my God, that's, that looks kind of, hmm. and, and it was gray. Mm -hmm. And I had already decided on my palette over here. I Gosh, so this wasn't even within your field of sight when you were working on the painting. Not at all. Wow. Not at all. So, but you know, I think we're, we're all, I had a professor uh, at, well, it was an undergraduate school. And he said, we're always painting the same painting. And, you know, there's a collectiveness in our mind where we, we don't know unconsciously that we draw from things. I mean, sometimes you'll notice, I've noticed with my students, they will paint like the clothes that they have on. You know, you know, I, I did that once I was working on a painting and I was like, where is this palette coming from? And I realized it was the cushion I was sitting on, on my chair. It was the exact same palette and I hadn't even realized I was doing it. Well, you know what? We, we are, and that's another one of my themes, interconnectedness. We mm. are all interconnected and everything is interconnected. And we're always drawing. And as sensitive artists that we all are, we, we can't help but draw from, well, we're not an island. No man is an island. We're drawing from sources. We're drawing from work we've seen. We're drawing from nature. We're drawing from uh, photo movies. You know, we're drawing from e everywhere. There's no limit. There's no reason to have a limit. This one is, it ha is waiting for its little hanging sculpture. So, and <laughs> it's yet to emerge. Well, it ha I, I have it figured out. Oh, okay. But, and, and I'll, I'll go get it. You can stay here. I'll bring it over here to show it. To okay. You. It's not yet completed. Okay. We're getting a sneak preview guys. This right. A student gave me this orange thing. It's kind of broken up and it, I just, I just slammed it on this. This, this is a um, pineapple. Yeah. And it, you're supposed to put toothpicks in and you know, oh. use it for an appetizer thing. Okay. <laughs> and I started gluing these little gems in there. You're right. Sort so, of referencing these little circles. Absolutely. So I see they, it. I see it, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm figuring it out with you. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. I can always use help. So this just fits. That's another thing I like to do. I walk around and look at my piles of, of collectibles over there. And when they just fit, mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that was kismet. This has to happen. And I like this pink, which is also part of my collection of stuff. It's, it's just strips of fabric. And I'm going to glue it on here after I glue this thing together. Then I, and it'll be hanging here. Mm. And I haven't decided what color chain or what kind of chain or if it's going to be seed beads or beads or something. That will happen once I get this conform to an actual hanging uh, piece of sculpture. That's very cool. And so over here is where I have all of the things that will eventually be hanging on in front of canvases from all kinds of supports. Oh, I see. And all kinds of things that are partially put together, but could be, you know, added to it, to another thing. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces, waiting to see where it goes, where I took the paint skin and I put these uh, wonderful red, icicles for, from Christmas trees, actually. And I put it inside this horn of plenty and it will be hanging in front of a canvas. Um, this armature will become something. This will probably be hanging from a canvas, maybe like that. Oh, I love that. 
that blue with the yellow. And this ball with all the buttons. Oh my gosh, I didn't even notice all of it. Like, this is the thing, Donna, when you start getting into your work, there's just so much that reveals itself the closer up and up you get. It's something that I learned in college, which is it has to work on two levels, you know, from far away. And then as you get up close as well, and your work is just the epitome of that for me, because from back here, your work is so striking and the closer and closer you get just all these little gems come out, all these little details. It's so exciting to be in the presence of your work. Thank, anyway, thank you. I'm going to stop you. fangirling and let you continue. Well, but no, <laughs> thank you. I, 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 I love that. I appreciate that. So this is what I do in my off hours. Um, I have lots of different kinds of rope and pieces of fabric and yarn, and I braid them. And then I make all of these little, little assemblages that I attach either with any kind of those lanyard attachments or if it's just a wire, I have to braid it in while I'm working. And this is just, <laughs> this is just detritus, you know, like things that I can find or, well, in some, I made this bead. In some cases, I, in ceramics, I'll make something. Um, it, but this is the tip of a, a frosting uh, kit. Mm -hmm. For like, yeah, cake icing. Yeah. <laughs> and a little piece of chain and a wooden bead and a scrap and plastic shoe uh, and a, part of a keychain or button, actually, I think that fell apart and a bell. I like bells. <laughs> uh, and just like this was a scrap I found out on the sidewalk somewhere. And this is a, like a popper from champagne, you know, the top of champagne. And this is a little strainer <laughs> that I got at flea markets and stuff. So, um, I put those together and I have done paintings where I hang them like on the outside. There's one piece where I did that. But right now I'm trying to figure out a way to just snake them all over the walls, like over there. And I'm more interested right now in snaking around on the walls and bringing them out on armatures. Mm. So like, like, coat rack armatures or hanging them from the ceiling. Yeah, like you know, a large scale installation. I'd like to do that. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, so I just keep, you know, making those things. Can I can I ask you something about the objects? So you were talking about how you find them. Do you ever, like, do people ever just give you things? People give me things all the time. People give me boxes of things and jars of buttons and, you know, they just they're cleaning out house and they, you know, they bring it to me, which is wonderful because they know that I, you know, like I'll use toy pieces when they're cleaning out their kids' stuff. Yeah. Uh, and wooden spools, which are hard to find anymore these days. And this I dipped half in paint. And this is encaustic, encaustic on both sides of this stick. Yeah. And um, yeah, they, and a napkin ring. Somebody gave me the napkin ring. Yeah. Do you find that when people experience your work that they want to touch it? Yes. Yes. And you know what? I'm, I make it pretty durable. So I'm, I'm okay with, but in certain cases where it has to like this, I wouldn't want them touching because it has to stay, it has to stay here. It shouldn't be like swinging around, but they could come up to this and, you know, go through this. These are, you know, these are pretty durable. I'm, I'm going to submit a proposal to do make these things, this braiding and making little assemblages to a college course for, a, um, for an extra thing where we're going to, I'm going to propose it where we're going to do like a big installation and I will bring the things and I will work too, but they're going to braid and then insert the little objects that they make. And maybe some of them will be meaningful to them. Yeah. 
And that collaborative work, is that something that you tend to do or do you find you have a solitary practice? I have a solitary practice. Once in a while, uh, like uh, years ago, I did a collaborative mail art, meaning through the mail, yeah. M-A-I-L art. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed all of the interaction of the people. And, and that I learned something. You always learn when you collaborate with people. And I'm open to collaborations, um, hence the, this project that I want to do with people. Yeah. Um, but in general, it's it's uh, it's the it's the things in the things in my head that have to come out and and have to come out a certain way. Yeah. You know? It's that little voice inside. That's what I tell fellow artists that you feel obligated to do it like it just drives you something it's so deep in your bones it's hard to explain to people that are perhaps not creative you just feel that urge you have to get that feeling out yeah it's nagging it'll nag yes you just keep nagging and nagging yes and you just go oh all right you know <laughs> and then you just go and do it and then you come to an impasse where okay now I'm supposed to do this but now how do I but so then that's exciting because that's a, a, a problem that you have to solve. Yeah. So that part I really enjoy when I try to figure out, okay, what do I need? You know, what material, how, you know, how will this stick with this? How will this glue, how will I hang this? What's, I'm dealing with gravity, you know, how, how can I make this stay together and not, you know, fall, fall apart and stay together with the aesthetic idea that is in here? Yeah. is like my inspiration um, mm -hmm. and I have uh, the surrealist look paintings in the Louvre uh, history of art and then I have a clip file of baseball I don't know I just loved some of these photos and I don't use figures but I'm going to but I just loved the way these figures are and the colors mm. the, and I have, this is just regular photos. Then I have things about ocean, things about shape, insects, turtle, frogs, horses. Here's a book on insects. This is the Adirondacks, French landscape. It's got a lot of trees in it. Um, I like boats. I want to do a piece with, with boats like this boat here. And with the sails, I'm just... I just really, I don't know, captivated with that. And then I have all kinds of artist work that have inspired me that I, I clip and I keep a file of like paintings that are inspirational to me or that I like some of their approaches and, and their color schemes that I would have never thought of. So I keep all that and then I leaf through this and keep this out all the time. And then I keep notebooks uh, with ideas where I'll take yeah. and I'll... Make little notes on it as well. Right. what you were thinking. Right. I need mm. to get better about that because I'll just like have something laying around and be like, well, what was I thinking about with that? <laughs> That's what happened to me. That's why I started doing this with, you know, all, all this, you know, going back and writing like what I liked about it and what, you know, what, what, what I should do to... to make that happen for me. And then these are all the sketchbooks where some of these ideas have, you know, come out that I'm working on composition or ideas. And um, that was something I was going to ask about your process. So do you sketch all of your paintings out ahead of time? Or is it just rough concepts? And then you let the painting reveal itself? What is that like for you? It is rough concepts. Sometimes on, on a couple occasions, it has been a dream. Mm. I don't have the piece here. It was, it's called Blue Lightning. It's in that little booklet. We'll show it here, guys. Here's a photo of it. <laughs> uh, and I dream, dreamed it just like I did it. Everything was solved. It, er, everything. That doesn't normally happen. I'll have a piece of a dream that'll say, oh, you know, do this or that, make a make a diagonal line, but I won't, I won't have the complete idea until I 
go along. All right, look through stuff here and I'll go, okay, yeah, that meshes with what what I think I see in here. And then I'll, then I'll draw that out. But So you might have an initial sketch or concept and then if the painting takes you in a different direction, you let it. Yes, except for that dream one called Blue Light. That one was very specific. That huh? one, yeah, I didn't deviate. But a, a lot of times it's not this big. It's a th it's a thumbnail sketch. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's just like two two by three. Um, I'm trying to think if I have some laying around here uh, because a lot of times I throw them away afterwards, you know, because it's like, okay, I did that. Um, and I don't usually draw them out this big, but this, I take all these sketchbooks with me and, and, and then I, I think about different, and I started painting on this one, but then I thought, you know what, I don't really need to paint. I've got the idea of what, what, what's what here. This was from going past the oil refineries, you know, in New Jersey. And then this was the same thing, but I also like stacks of wood. Mm. I love David Hockney's series with the stacks of wood and how he got that oil paint so nice, the circles and ooh, so luscious. So, um, so that's where these, these, and that I draw flowers. Um, and there, I've got lots of sketchbooks all over. Sometimes I forget where the sketch is that I want to look at. So I have to drag them all out. In terms of my supplies, um, down here are uh, all of my stencils and things that I might use in the painting for, to get a background or a drawing. And I have them all labeled so that I can get to them. Uh, here are my all of my scraping knives. Ooh. And yeah, I just go to Home Depot and I grab whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever speaks to me. Very cool. And I like, um, I haven't tried this yet, but this, th these are uh, protectors that you put on the bottom of furniture. Oh, yeah. But I'm going to embed them with paint, and then I'm going to use it on a canvas to repeat a polka dot. We'll see if it works. It's just an idea I came up with, so I don't know if it'll work. I need to get me one of those, so I'm not, I do all my dots by hand. <laughs> well, then here's another thing, then. So a lot of the circles I make, I roll some paint out, mm -hmm. get the paint on it, and then where I want to dot. Uh, and then I've got like rollers that I like to use. They're also kids things, but I get parallel lines mm. on my paintings. And, and then I like this one too, because this is- Oh, that's mm, fun. Yeah. Textured. Right. So these are some of my favorite things to draw on top of, of uh, acrylic canvases. Also, I use them on paper, these solid markers. I just purchased an entire one of the yellow recently. I haven't used it yet. I saw someone using them online and I purchased them and I thought it would be a combination of colors and it ended out being all yellow. <laughs> well, then you're gonna have to do a lot of yellow. It's, <laughs> it's like painting with lipstick, you know? It's just really, it's gooey and fun. Does and it dry in? Yeah, it dries, it dries nice. Ooh. Really does, it dries nicely. So um, these are my watercolors and my uh, gouache. And this is a mixture of um, like uh, crayon dash and um, these, I don't really exactly know what these are, but I like these. They're water soluble too, and they, they draw really nicely. Um, crepas, oil crayons. And then these are my oil base uh, opaque paint markers. And that is that goes over acrylic paint and over oil paintings too. You can't use the uh, you can't use the acrylic markers over oil paintings. And I like to make I like to mix them. So this is my colored pencil sets. I, and I love using colored pencils. And then this is this is just the lead of Prismacolor. They were selling them like this for a while. I don't know where I found that, but I like that. Yeah. And 
And this set underneath there is like 144 different colors. This is all inks and some alcohol inks. Uh, more colored pencils, different kinds. These are like pastel pencils. This is charcoal and of course Sharpies and then some different kinds of colored pencils. Uh, this is watercolor. And oh, oh, and these are fun too. These watercolor sticks, they're really fun to draw. And then it's dry, and then you just get your brush oh, out. by Sakura. I see. Oh, yep, I see the emblem on there. Daniel, Daniel Smith. Smith. Here you go, guys. You guys are always commenting about Daniel Smith. We finally have some Daniel Smith supplies here. <laughs> yes, and I love them. Yeah, this, this they're whole, the good stuff. Yeah, this whole thing is... Daniel Smith. And See, I saw the emblem and thought it was um, a different brand. But yes, Daniel Smith is, people People love that stuff. I haven't tried it. Well, you're going to have to. <laughs> you're going you're to fall in love with them. I love the idea of drawing it and it's dry. And then I, you know, go ahead and, and then paint with water. And then they, they're paintings. And I do like these a lot, too. And then down here we have oh, more, more, of, those. more yeah. of these markers. And then this is black ink. And then generally, this is mixtures of, of gouache that I'm saving and I can always, and watercolor that I can reconstitute. And then empty bottles for dripping and splashing and spraying. And I love drawing with litho crayons. Mm. These are watercolor pencils. Mm. And I, I, just, I just love these. I love all golden products. Oh, I've been, yeah. <laughs> I've been using them since since the company started. In fact, I used to be able to just call the, the guy that opened up the place in the beginning, Mark or, or Sam. I think I talked to Sam. I know I talked to Mark. I love this interference. So here's an interesting thing I'm doing on this piece. This this was all acrylic. These are these little colors here are these. Uh, Posca. Yeah. People know I'm obsessed. I like I'm known pasta. as a Posca head. That's, really? That's what it's called online now. Cool. <laughs> I, I love these things too. So You're also a Posca head. I am. <laughs> so what I did was with this Prismacolor watercolor pencil, I started making these lines. And then now this is pencil. This is watercolor pencil on acrylic. It's probably not going to stay. Could like actually wipe off. So I go, hmm. So I get this out, pour a little out, brush a little on, and look at how beautiful it makes that line. It pops. Mm -hmm. So all of these are going to be painted over. Um, this is going to be covered with these things all the way up here. Mm. And then so, when you're done, you'll go in and yeah. use a fine brush to paint that on. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And I love that combination. I was going to ask, in terms of these larger scale paintings, do you just prop them up wherever you find a spot and work on them, or do you? Is it always here? No, it's. Uh, I have these installation, these installed here, mm -hmm. so that when the director of the Monmouth Museum comes, comes by, yeah, for display purposes. But, yeah, but your typical studio day, you wouldn't have them up. No, and this would be your workspace, right? And and I also use these saw horses, and I work flat on the saw horses a lot. Oh, I see. Oh, that's actually kind of a genius idea because then you don't have to have a table taking up space all the time. Right. Yeah. And then and then I'll lift it up like this is the first time I've seen that piece over there upright cuz it's been on the saw horses that pink piece with the necklace thing. And you just propped it up. Now you're seeing it. Now this is the first time I'm seeing it. So, and then that further it has to be propped up so that I can find the appropriate assemblage to go in front of it. And then I and then I hang it on a nail. See that nail that's ready? Mm -hmm. I hang it on a nail to see do I like it? Do I do I want it? and then I try different different things all the time. Yeah. Before I finally settle on something. And sometimes the interesting thing is, you know, the there are sometimes when you're working on something you think it only has to be one way, but that's not true. There are a lot of solutions. There, and I and I tell my students that, and then they get confused. 
and then I say, well, if they all work, then it's just eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And a lot of times I, f I find things that don't work at all. And, and I know that is not going to be something I want to have up. That's an instinctual feeling, though, that you have from being in your art practice for so long that a lot of students may not know. True, true. So That's something intuitively you've learned over time. Yes. And then um, when I'm also working on the paintings, I, I go to my stack of, of already cut stencils mm -hmm. and ideas and um, to pull out, to block you know, certain areas and to paint in certain areas. So I, I go back and forth to that. So then this is a piece I'm working on right now that I'm, when I'm done painting on a painting, I'm just going over the, this is straw that's sewn together with parachute thread. This will have something on the top. So that's when I was saying I work on seven things. So I'll be working on a drawing uh, over there, I'll be working on a painting. I'll be working on a bigger drawing, like on this table. Here I am, I'm working on, I am, I'm working on a, uh, I'm gonna do a photolithography print. Um, I'm actually going to uh, 10 Grand Press next month, uh, next week. And uh, Marina is the artist, the printer, and she and I are going to work for a day on, on a 22 by 30 printer or, you know, a few of them in photolithography. So I have printed out some of the images that I will sort through and see, it, you know, how I'm going to use them. So I'm, I'm still going to incorporate this polygon shape with stripes most likely in the print. This is my, my drawing format for the print because it's 22 by 30. So I haven't started drawing on that, but then I've made some, some preliminary drawings. This sort of ties in with the necklace, call it the necklace piece. It's really not accurate, but uh, I don't think the I'm- braided gonna... work as well as the motif that's appearing in your painting. Right. And so th this, I just, this is a quick, I love bricks behind the pieces. You can see that one that I was working on. And then, of course, the triangles. And so these are like my thinking my thinking pages. So that's, that's what I'm working on over here to, to, to lay this out. And then when, when, my, when my mind needs a break, I, then I just go to, you know, chop wood, cu uh, carry water, which means cutting these strips into triangles that I'm gonna use for my work. And so then that's, this is like a relaxation time. Yeah, when you're done a little bit of the creative thinking, a little bit of production, so you have materials you can reference. Right, and then, and then the, this is where a lot of the, well, actually all of the things come from that I've collected that I then and that I bought at flea markets or yard sales that oh I Oh my gosh, that is a gourd right there if I've ever seen one. Right. And so and and it was a it's a children's game or toy. And anyway, so uh, here are things that I I have them to, here to put together to decide and then every now and then I go off on a on a tangent where I just I see that I actually glazed this and and uh, whatever you know made the i it was a form you know that you do in a, one of those ceramic places where you buy a form yeah mold and the, yeah mold right and then i drilled all the holes in it and then i just did you know uh meditative i like that kind of thing yeah repetitive yeah. action yep yeah. and i don't know you know where it'll may end up in a piece that i'm going to hang you know, from one of my paintings, or it may actually end up in a separate, you know, uh, separate, you know, assemblage. Like this is actually a, a little separate little assemblage. I think this is a good point, though, to follow your instinct as an artist to keep making things, and it might reveal itself to you later where it's meant to be ultimately. Right. I mean, and sometimes 
the stuff stands around for years. You know, like these, I've had these for a long time. Then, and this is a piece that I clean my brush off also while I'm working, and it will hang in front of a painting. Then over here, with this, over here is one of my, like, I love, I love this. This is my mini art museum here. And these are all little mini assemblages that I've made. Can you talk a little bit about scale in your work? Because obviously you work on very large paintings. Was that something you were always drawn to or is that something over time that you kind of scaled up your work? Yeah, I, I always did large paintings when I was in undergraduate school and graduate school, as, you know, as big as I could get them, yeah. to get them in the door, to get them up the steps, you know. Um, and I like that. And then I found that to be kind of meditative, I found that I started, even while I was working on stuff, I started just like putting putting things together to just sort of like goof around with. And and then I started just making all those small, not this small, this, this I did a few years ago, but usually about eight inches by five inches by five inches or something. And what I liked about that is that they, they, it was an easier show to carry around, you know, to take places. And then I started doing drawings and paintings of them. And then I got bigger again. You know, studio, your space dictates a lot about your art. It absolutely does. Oh, and this is an example of the paint skins. This is where I took that one piece out over there, the, the one with the um, basalt columns, the first one that we looked at with the basalt columns. This is where I took the piece out. And this is the gloss medium. And this is freezer paper. What happens is that when I'm working, I lay all this is freezer paper. And then I look at the freezer paper and I go, wow, that's kind of exciting. That could be a paint skin. And so then I just firm it up like making little little bo little boxes by folding the paper up so that I have a rim that'll hold the medium in mm -hmm. because now the gel medium isn't you know runny but I, I don't use the gel medium most of the time I use the gloss medium and it is runny and if you don't have an edge it'll spill over yeah so that so that's what happens it that's how they're that's how they're created is that I look at and then I save these for me to think about whether or not I want to do a paint skin on top of it. Over here, I'm working on pieces of wood and I put it on this heavy duty mat board because they, you know, they're fragile little pieces. And then I started just collaging on them and working with them and using, this is graphite powder, which I've smeared on here and I, removed some of it with an eraser. I got to go back over, see what I, you know, to get an hourglass. And then these are all Duro mounted pieces that I have that I may or may not put in uh, the collage. So you have a mixed media table, a collage table. So that's what I mean by seven things because I'm working on that one painting over there. At the same time, I'm thinking about that multicolored one with the with the rope that the rope is leaning against now, which as I look over it, I don't I don't mind it too much. It looks okay. And I work on two or three of these uh, uh, at one time, but I just consider that one thing. And then this is in the back of my mind. Then I'm working in black and white over there, and then I'm trying to finish this companion piece. And then I'm working on the tree and the photograph, so it might be more than seven. And then I'm working on this piece of sculpture, <laughs> which is nice because it's crocheting. I sit here on the floor and I crochet. I crochet it. I'm going to close it all up. It's going to be a tube. And then I don't know exactly. I'm going to either hang little things like that, little assemblages on it, or I'm going to stick colorful sticks through it, you know, that I've painted, or, um, 
even uh, spray paint it or throw glitter on it. Uh, I, I don't know. It's And I don't worry about it because, as you know, being a creative person, it'll tell you where it wants to go. Yeah. But only in its own time, not when you necessarily want it to tell you. That's why I work on more than one thing. Because when this isn't talking to me anymore, I can go over to this. And then when this isn't talking anymore, I can pick up a, a triangle and I can go over to that painting. Oh yeah, I forgot that I'm working on that one too. And when there's never a time nothing is working if you have a lot of things. If you've got a lot of burners, a lot of soup on the burners, there's always some soup that you can work with. So would you say that's one of your keys to having a long-term art practice is just keep making different things at the same time and it just keeps you going and going and going? It's a key, but it's also, as we spoke about earlier, the muse doesn't let you rest. And it, it's, it's not only that, um, it's a self-discovery. It's um, an outlet. It's therapy. It's meditative. Um, a person such as yourself loves media like I do. I mean, I love the lushness. I call it yumminess. Yumminess. <laughs> Absolutely. And, the, and I don't just draw the line at... at as most artists do, they also not draw the line at what's traditional paint and stuff. I will find kids' toys, uh, discarded pieces of jewelry, piece of pieces of cookware, and be able to incorporate them. So, so I f feel that all of those things can dictate to me and inspire me and 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 tell me, you know, in what direction to go. And so it's, it's a combination of um, self-discovery, um, being a part of this whole creative energy that's just out there that we can all tap into. No, no, nobody has just a, a, a limit, you know. It's not just one person has access to this creative inspiration that, you know, it's there for all of us in all different ways. Do you ever get creative burnout? It's okay if you don't. Uh, no, I, I'm trying to think. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think. No, I, no, I never, you know, I mean, no. I get disgusted with the art world. I get frustrated with getting the work out there um, the business of art, not so much the art making. Yeah, never the art making. It's it's all about the madness of art, the craziness, the 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 subjectivity, the rejections, the um, lack of exposure, the trying to find out who's who's the person that can, you know, uh, light up my career. You know, who's the dealer? Who's the, you know, influential critic? Who is trying to find that? The, that, and, and sometimes I'll say, uh, why, why am I making all this stuff? Because it's just piling up. But it, it, uh, it feeds my soul to, to, make, to make it. And I, it's two different things. You know, an artist has to see that other world as not really, um, it's not soul feeding. The art market is not soul feeding. Um, so you have to not internalize what happens out there. have you been in this space? 
30 years. 30 years. This is what 30 years of a studio looks like. <laughs> Plus there's art stacked up in the loft and then there's a huge inventory of art downstairs. I have a stable. Uh, I have two flat files filled with drawings and I have, the stable is about a quarter the size of this room and it's stuffed with paintings and sculpture and then another area uh, that we have it's all temperature controlled is is also about half the size of this studio and it's filled with sculptures wow. down, downstairs and just keep making more <laughs> Well, I think that's a good note to actually end on. So thank you very much for being so generous with your studio and sharing your process with us. Thank and you. Um, we'll leave everything linked below to Donna's work so you can find her on social media as well as her website. Thank you, Fiona. We'll see you guys in the next one. Till then, stay well and stay inspired. Bye. <laughs>